Hey everyone, Nigel here. Just wanted to give you a heads up that today's video is technically a re-release. However, there's an exciting reason why. As we've teased a couple of times in the last little while, we've actually been working on a secret project for the channel for some time. Well, we're happy to report that after several months, we're finally in the home stretch. We should be ready to show you everything next month, but in the meantime, we're in a bit of a crunch trying to get everything finished in time. We're really excited to show you what we've been working on, and we're going to provide more details over the next couple of weeks, so be sure to keep an eye out. In the meantime, we apologize in advance for any wonkiness with our release schedule. We promise it's only temporary. With that being said, we think today's story will probably still be new to a lot of you, so we hope you find it interesting and informative. With that out of the way, let's get into it. On April 17th, 1935, a man named Bert Hobson set out with his son Ron to do some fishing off the coast of Coogee Beach in Sydney, Australia. On this particular day, the two cast their line about a mile and a half away from the shore, and it wasn't long before they got a bite. It turned out to be a small tiger shark. Much to his surprise, before Hobson could reel in his line, a larger tiger shark also became interested in the catch. The large shark, which was about 14 feet long, quickly swallowed the smaller one, becoming tangled in Hobson's fishing line in the process. Though it was quite a struggle, Hobson was an experienced fisherman, and he managed to get the large shark back to shore alive. He took the animal to his business at the Coogee Aquarium and swimming baths, where it was put on display. Like many business owners during the Great Depression, Hobson was struggling at the time, and he hoped that his newly caught shark might draw the attention of members of the public, especially as they visited the aquarium during the upcoming Anzac Day holiday. Hobson would ultimately get his wish, albeit not in the way that he ever could have imagined. While Hobson's tiger shark seemed to be adapting well to its new home in the first few days after it was caught, things took an abrupt turn on April 25th. The shark started to act strangely, its movement was slow, it swam in irregular circles, and it appeared to be disoriented. Then, in full view of a small crowd of people that had gathered to watch it, the shark revealed the apparent cause of its illness. Out of its mouth, it regurgitated a rat, a bird, and finally, a human arm. Little did anyone know at the time, but it was a discovery that would lead to one of the strangest murder mysteries in the history of Australia. This is the story of the shark arm murders. Initially, it was assumed that the arm found at the Coogee Aquarium belonged to the unfortunate victim of a shark attack. After all, at least three people had already died in similar incidents earlier that year on nearby beaches, and these attacks were still at the forefront of many people's minds. However, when a medical examination was conducted on the arm, no signs of injuries from teeth marks could be found. Instead, all the evidence pointed to the limb having been removed by a knife. Furthermore, the coroner was careful to state that he didn't believe the arm had been removed in any kind of surgical procedure either. In short, whoever this limb belonged to, there was a good chance that they had been murdered. When a formal investigation was launched, the first priority of detectives was to uncover the identity of the unknown victim. In a bid to see if there were more remains inside of the tiger shark, it was killed and opened within three days of the discovery of the arm. It's unclear if police were actually the ones to do this or whether it was someone else. A couple of sources we came across actually mentioned that Hobson passed the shark off to a third party after it regurgitated the arm, and that the way this was handled hampered the investigation. In any case, what we do know is that no other remains were found inside the shark. Luckily, investigators still had one major clue to go on. It turned out that there was actually a tattoo on the arm. The tattoo depicted two boxers about to square off against one another, and detectives hoped that it was distinctive enough that it might lead to an identification. In order to get this information out, police allowed images of the tattoo to be printed in local newspapers. One such publication was a Sydney outlet called Truth. It was here that the image was discovered by a man named Edward Smith, who recognized it immediately as a tattoo his brother James had on his left forearm. 
What's more, he knew that James had been missing for at least a couple of weeks. Edward took his information to the police, and he, along with his brother's wife Gladys, were able to confirm that the tattoo on the arm was a match to James's. His identity was subsequently confirmed thanks to fingerprint analysis. With a positive identification made, police now turned their attention to finding how and why the partial remains of James Smith had ended up in the stomach of a tiger shark. Though investigators were fairly sure by this point that they were dealing with a murder case, it seems that any lingering doubt about whether this had been an accident or whether James had somehow taken his own life was put to rest when detectives spoke to Gladys and Edward. Both insisted that James was happy, had many friends, and loved his wife and son. In their words, he was a man with everything to live for. Besides, as previously mentioned, none of the evidence in the case seemed to point to an accident, or the wound to James's arm being self-inflicted. It's at this point that we should mention that some of the reports we came across also allege that when the arm was discovered, there was a length of rope tied securely around the wrist. We're not 100% sure if this was the case, since it was only mentioned in a few of the news reports from the time. However, we thought it was worth mentioning because if true, it would seem to count as further evidence that James Smith's death was a murder. When police dug into James's personal life, they learned that he had quite the interesting background. Originally from England, he had moved to Australia at the age of 17, where he had spent several years fighting as a lightweight boxer seemingly explaining his trademark tattoo. After that, he had tried his hand at many things, working in athletic clubs, billiard saloons, and even owning a saloon of his own before eventually taking a job as a builder's assistant. However, this was the sanitized version of James's life, the one that would initially be printed nearly verbatim in all of the newspapers. One headline in Truth even called him, quote, a man with seemingly not an enemy in the world. In actuality, James Smith was a small-time criminal who for years had been involved in Sydney's thriving illegal betting and gambling underworld. Though he had only been convicted on minor charges, he was well known in the scene, and as police would soon learn, had allegedly used the connections he had made there to move on to more serious crimes. For those who wondered earlier about how police had been able to identify James's arm thanks to fingerprints, it's apparently because they were on file from these previous convictions. When investigators spoke to James's wife, Gladys, she told them that she had last seen him on April 7th or 8th at their home in the suburb of Gladesville. On that day, James told her and his mother that he was leaving for a couple of days because he had been paid by a party of people to take them fishing. Things get a little fuzzy here because some reports state that Gladys had no idea where her husband was going or who he was with while others state that James mentioned something about heading to the beachside suburb of Cronulla. What we do know is that James Smith never returned from that trip. Gladys said that for the first few days she wasn't worried, since it wasn't unusual for her husband to be gone like this. However, things had taken a strange turn on April 12th, when out of the blue she received a phone call from a man whose voice she didn't recognize telling her not to worry, and that James would be home in three days' time. The man didn't give his name, and neither Gladys nor James's mother knew what to make of the mysterious call. Whether because of the tip from Gladys Smith or some other bit of information that isn't mentioned in the newspaper record, the police began chasing down leads in Cronulla. These leads pointed them to the popular Cecil Hotel, where several witnesses remembered James drinking and playing dominoes on or around the 8th of April. They said that he was in the company of a man named Patrick Brady. Not only was Brady well known to James Smith, he also had a reputation amongst law enforcement as an expert forger. At the time that the two were seen together, Brady had been renting a cottage in Cronulla, located on the shore of Gunamata Bay, not too far from the Cecil Hotel. It turned out that Brady had vacated the cottage almost immediately after, even though the rent he had paid on the place was not yet up. Even more unusual, when the owner of the cottage went there to inspect it after Brady left, he found the place suspiciously clean. He also noticed that one of the cottage's mattresses had been replaced, 
along with a tin trunk. Several other small items appeared to be missing altogether, including a rowboat paddle, a length of rope, and a small anchor. Unfortunately, once again, there are some discrepancies in the record, as not all of the reports mention that these items were missing. Furthermore, there also seems to be some confusion about a rowboat that was at the cottage. Several reports we came across mentioned that the boat was found scrubbed clean, while others say the exact opposite, that the boat was found unusually dirty, even stained with what appeared to be blood. While either of these could technically be viewed as suspicious, the contradictions unfortunately make it impossible to say which version of events is true. Still, what we do know is that when police uncovered the information about Brady and the cottage, they became extremely suspicious and began to theorize that this may have been the place where James Smith was murdered. This theory seems to have been solidified for investigators when a cab driver from Cronulla came forward and told police that he'd had a bizarre interaction with Patrick Brady the day after he had been seen at the Cecil Hotel with James Smith. The cab driver said that Brady had asked him to drive to a residence in North Sydney and had seemed nervous and disheveled at the time, almost as if he'd been up all night. During the ride, the driver said it appeared that he was hiding something in his coat. On May 17th, Patrick Brady was arrested. It's worth pointing out that he was actually arrested on charges of forging a money order, suggesting that investigators felt that they did not yet have a solid murder case against him, and instead simply needed a reason to keep him in custody. However, within days of his arrest, he was charged with killing James Smith. When Brady was taken into custody, he initially refused to say anything, but when police began questioning his wife, he agreed to talk. Brady told investigators that he was not involved in the murder, and that James had instead been killed by a mutual associate of theirs named Reginald Holmes. Holmes was a successful businessman and socialite who ran a boat building company in the suburb of McMahon's Point, and his name coming up in connection with James's murder was interesting for two reasons. For starters, James had worked for Holmes on and off for years until 1934, when they had supposedly had a falling out. The second thing that interested police was that according to the cab driver they had spoken to, it was Holmes's residence where he had dropped off Patrick Brady on the day that he was acting strangely. When police spoke to Reginald Holmes, he claimed that he didn't know Brady and denied the accusations that were made against him. As investigators continued to dig further and spoke to more witnesses, they began to uncover evidence that the connection between Reginald Holmes and James Smith was far from a standard business relationship. While Holmes did his best to project the appearance of being an upstanding member of society, he was actually the leader of a lucrative drug smuggling ring. Using a fleet of speedboats that he owned through his boat building company, Holmes would have people on his payroll pick up shipments of cocaine, illegal cigarettes, and other illicit items that were thrown from passing ships off the coast of where his business was located. It turned out that James Smith was one of the people who had driven the speedboats and had helped smuggle the contraband. The men's illegal activities didn't stop there. James Smith had actually introduced Patrick Brady to Holmes because of his talent for forgery. The three had used Brady's skills to rip off Holmes' clients. After they would pay for services from his business, Brady would forge their signatures on fraudulent checks so that they could steal money from their bank accounts. Finally, James and Holmes had also run insurance scams together, the last of which had reportedly caused the rumored falling out between them. According to sources we came across in our research, the scam in question involved a boat called the Pathfinder, a pleasure cruiser that Holmes owned and which James had worked as the caretaker of until it was destroyed in 1934. Though Holmes claimed to his insurance company that the boat had been destroyed in an accident, the suspicious circumstances surrounding the wreck attracted the attention of police at the time. While it appears that little became of the case, Holmes either never tried or was never able to collect his insurance money. Based on statements from Brady and other witnesses, police learned that James had been angry about the insurance money and felt that Holmes owed him money for his part in the scam. They theorized that he might have been blackmailing Holmes at the time of his murder threatening to expose what he knew about Holmes' smuggling operation. However, before investigators could find any solid evidence to prove this, the case would take another strange turn. 
Several days after Brady's arrest, Holmes took one of his speedboats out into the middle of the water near his business and attempted to take his own life. Once again, sources describe the incident and its aftermath in several different ways, but the essentials of the story are that Holmes shot himself with a small caliber weapon, which only wounded him instead of killing him. When he fell into the water, the resulting shock revived him, and he climbed back into his boat. Unfortunately for Holmes, he was far from the only person out on the water that day, and at least one other person who witnessed the event called the police and explained what was going on. When they came out to investigate, Holmes tried to escape, leading officers on a high-speed boat chase that lasted several hours, until finally, Holmes gave up. After his arrest, Holmes first tried to explain his actions by saying that someone had been trying to kill him, and that when police began to chase him, he tried to escape because he assumed that they were the culprits. Eventually, though, he agreed to tell police what he knew about the murder of James Smith. Holmes was eager to get the attention off of himself, and pointed the finger right back at Patrick Brady. Not only that, but he claimed that Brady had actually tried to blackmail him after the killing, and that this is why he had shown up at his house after the murder. Holmes explained that Brady had killed James at the place that he had been renting in Cronulla, disposing of most of the body in the tin trunk that was missing from the cottage, which he had thrown in Gunnamatta Bay. Holmes alleged that Brady had kept James's arm in order to threaten him, and when he had come to his house, had demanded money, saying that if he didn't pay up, he would pin the murder on him. Holmes said that he had agreed to pay the money, and Brady left the arm behind. He had later disposed of it in the ocean in a panic, where it was presumably eaten by the shark. After giving these details to police, Holmes also agreed to testify against Brady in court. With this, authorities now decided to move ahead with the case against Patrick Brady, and an inquest hearing was scheduled to begin on June 12th. While it seemed like the sensational case might now be nearing a resolution, things took yet another wild turn when sometime between the night of June 11th and the morning of the 12th, Reginald Holmes was found dead from gunshot wounds in his car at Dawes Point, close to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Given Holmes' recent track record with trying to take his own life, investigators were somewhat hesitant to definitively declare his death a murder. However, it seems that this is where most of the evidence pointed. Despite the loss of their star witness, authorities decided to press on with the inquest. Many people were called during the proceedings to give testimony, including the cab driver who claimed to have driven Brady to Holmes' residence after the murder, as well as Holmes' wife, who said that she remembered Brady coming to the residence, and likewise said that he seemed nervous and agitated. James Smith's wife, Gladys, gave testimony about when she had last seen her husband, as well as his alleged business dealings with shady characters, including Brady and Holmes. The owner of the cottage where Brady had stayed testified about the strange state of the place when he had inspected it, as well as the items he said that were missing or had been replaced. Brady's defense, meanwhile, argued that these statements did not actually amount to a case, and that there wasn't any evidence against him definitively tying him to the murder. In fact, the defense argued that there wasn't even conclusive proof legally that James Smith was actually dead. To this end, Brady's lawyer cited a couple of different legal precedents that were hundreds of years old, in which cases were dismissed on the grounds that partial remains did not constitute a body. The defense contended it was possible that James had cut off his own arm or had had help in order to fake his own death. Brady's lawyer also attacked the idea that the arm could have survived in such good condition in the shark's stomach for as long as it did, saying that perhaps someone had thrown it into the tank at the Kuji Aquarium in order to cover their tracks. This seems unlikely, however, as if you remember, there was a crowd of people who witnessed the arm come out of the shark's mouth. Though the case did survive the inquiry and made it to trial in September of that year, the proceedings lasted only two days after which the judge sided with the defense and directed the jury to find Brady not guilty. It appears that his freedom was short-lived, as he was rearrested not long after his murder acquittal on the same forgery charges he was originally held on, and was subsequently sentenced to three years in prison. No one else was ever convicted of the murder of James Smith or Reginald Holmes, and today 
Both cases remain a mystery. From here, all we can do is speculate. However, there have been quite a few theories that have been advanced over the years. The most obvious of these, of course, is that Brady was guilty and simply got away with murder. Though if you ask us, police never came up with a satisfactory reason as to why Brady alone would have committed the crime. Perhaps most of what Reginald Holmes said was true, that Brady had committed the crime and that he had tried to blackmail him afterwards. However, this would seem to make far more sense if Holmes had ordered the murder in the first place. If James Smith was threatening to expose his illegal activities, Holmes would have had a motive for wanting him dead, and ordering Brady to carry out the crime would have made sense. As for why Holmes himself ended up dead, we know that he tried to take his own life once, and many have speculated that his actual death may have simply been a second successful attempt. People who believe this theory usually point out that Holmes had a generous life insurance policy, and whether he was involved in the murder or not, chances are he knew it was only a matter of time before he was imprisoned for his other illegal activities. As a result, it's theorized that maybe he orchestrated his own murder in order to make sure that there would be some money left behind for his wife. It's worth pointing out that some reports we came across mention that Holmes did make a large cash withdrawal just before he was found dead. Of course, it's also possible that someone else killed him to silence him, or that it was a complete coincidence. After all, Holmes was involved in drug smuggling, and there would have been plenty of people who probably would have benefited from killing him at the time. There's one final theory in the case that's worth talking about, and it comes from an Australian legal historian named Alex Castles. Castles actually wrote a book called The Shark Arm Murders, in which he proposed a completely different suspect that we have not yet mentioned. According to Castles, James Smith was actually a police informant, and one of the tips he gave to authorities resulted in the arrest of a man named Eddie Wyman. Wyman was an active figure in Sydney's criminal underworld at the time, and obviously would have wanted revenge, especially after discovering James was an informant. Castles therefore theorized that James could have been murdered on Wyman's orders, possibly even by Patrick Brady. Still, the cases have never officially been linked, and the shark arm murders remain a perplexing mystery. That being said, now that you've heard the whole story, be sure to let us know what you think actually happened in the comments section below, including any additional information about the case you might know, or any theories you think we might have left out. And as always, thank you for watching. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.